groups that come forward and, and share them in a report so that eventually um, uh, we'll have a report that talks about everything that is happening across the country. And also we will be posting all of these so you can look at what other people in other parts of the country are saying. Oh, John, I see John Hopday there. John, welcome. Hi, John, you can wave, we see you. I don't, oh, okay, well, John Hobday is uh, our uh, vice chair. Oh, great, I'm glad John's on. Uh, um, uh, Vicky, are you here? Vicky Cummings often joins us. Vicky is, is our um, director of uh, strategic partnerships. And uh, who have I, have not missed anybody? Let me just look at all the faces. <laughs> I think I've got everybody. So <laughs> welcome, so this is the, the team. And um, I'm going to turn you over to uh, Jennifer, who's going to talk you through uh, using the Zoom, which everybody in the world seems to be using just at the moment. It's a wonder that Zoom hasn't totally crashed, but apparently not, uh, which is wonderful for us. So um, Jennifer, it's yours. Thank you, Larry. Also wanted to mention Tim Borlase is here, who is also on our Where's board of Tim? Oh, yeah. Tim. Tim, <laughs> hi, Tim. Oh, Tim is a, a board member. Uh, also, who just happens to be in Nova Scotia, which is very nice. Wonderful. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> so most of you are probably very familiar with Zoom. There may be some who are not, so I'll just go through it very briefly here. First of all, if you would like to participate in the discussion, um, then we ask you to, if possible, enable your video. And uh, if you don't have video, uh, but you still want to participate, just uh, either send me a message or just unmute yourself when you would like to, uh, to speak. And we'll make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, <clears throat> so uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu that uh, there's one button that says participants. If you click on that, there will be a, uh, a menu that comes up on your right-hand side and shows everybody who's on the conversation here. And you'll also notice that there, you have the ability to raise hand. So uh, as we go through the conversation uh, and you want to make a point or you want to say something, please do raise your hand virtually if possible. Uh, it helps a lot. Uh, if you can't figure it out how to raise your hand, then just you know, wave and uh, we'll, we'll still call on you. Um, also, there is a chat function at the bottom there. If you can enable the chat as well, um, then uh, you can leave a message for everyone. Uh, you can comment while someone is speaking if you don't want to not interrupt. Uh, or you can also private message someone if you want to perhaps ask for uh, contact information to follow up with them at a later date. People have also been posting links to uh, things that they're talking about. Um, and anything that you post uh, will be shared um, more broadly even throughout our network as well. So do feel free to use the chat option. And also throughout the call, I will be launching a few polls. Um, <clears throat> and that's just to help us get some quantitative data um, with our reports that Larry was mentioning. And, uh, but do, just to let you know, these are completely confidential. I'll have no way of knowing what it is specifically that you push. So please, um, please do feel free to take part in the polls as well. And I think I covered everything. So um, again, if you want to participate, please do uh, enable your video. And what we're going to do right now is just go around the room. And if you could say your name and your uh, title um, or your job or your uh, any uh, organization that you may be affiliated with, if applicable, as well as one or two sentences of how the current situation and the, the the self-isolation and social, social distancing have been affecting you um, and your work at this point. All right, so we'll get started with Anna. Hi, uh, this is Anna O'Reil. I'm the Executive Director for Carfax Maritimes. I'm uh, in uh, Dieppe, New Brunswick, actually. Uh, like everybody else, we are very, very concerned about uh, artists in general, obviously, and also about our members. Um, I'm not hearing very much uh, from the members just now. However, we are trying to uh, uh, nationally to uh, keep in touch with as many as we possibly can. And of course, hoping that uh, this will, uh, this will uh, be uh, back to a new normal uh, shortly. 
Great. Thank you, Anna. And also, just so you know, I may be muting people. If Generally, if you're not speaking, um, it's best to be muted. And if you need help being unmuted, just let me know. Um, Amy. Hi, um, I'm Amy Ash, and I'm an artist. I'm also an instructor at the um, New Brunswick College of Craft and Design and a freelance curator. And um, so I feel really fortunate on one hand, the classes that I'm teaching are at the college are still carrying on, albeit online. Um, but the curatorial work and other um, consultant work is all on pause. I have one show up at the Beaver Book right now, which of course is closed. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious, wanted to see how everyone else was doing with all of this. And yeah, so I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. Great, thank you. Um, Andrea. Oh, I think, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, hi, Andrea Ritchie. Uh, I'm with Visual Arts Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm here particularly uh, because of my capacity as the coordinator of our Artist in the Schools program, uh, which is called Paints, Professional Artists in the Schools. Uh, also in interest of all of our programming through Visual Arts Nova Scotia, which, um, you know, we're reaching out to support artists within the province, within our membership. Uh, figuring out right now what we can do. Uh, obviously, my program, a school-based program, is halted. Um, we are presently uh, looking at how we can help artists take some of those workshops online, and also looking at more globally how we can support visual artists in the province going forward uh, with uh, during this pandemic and post. Uh, because we don't have an anticipation that it's going to be, I think we all know we're not flipping a switch back to the way it was at the beginning of March. Thanks right. for doing this. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth. I'm trying to unmute you here. Uh, there you go. Okay, there I am. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Circum, so I'm uh, I'm a two kinds of artist. I'm a visual artist, and I uh, I'm a sculptor, and I work a lot with visual arts Nova Scotia, notably through paints. Hi, Andrea, and uh, so obviously I'm connected to the present situation through that aspect of things. And I'm also a musician, and I'm the program director for the Acadia Regional Youth Orchestra program, which is run out of um, I. Acadia University premises. Hello, Mark Hopkins. I see you down in the corner down there. So we actually had to shut down our program, unfortunately, one week before our performance date. We had lots of performances scheduled for the children. It's a string program and we had to obviously cancel all of that. Um, so uh, I would have probably all the same questions as everybody else. My husband is also a full-time painter and his gallery has also closed for the duration. So some of our questions have to do with longer, much longer term than just when this crisis is over. We have this feeling that for practicing artists trying to sell their work, there's going to be an extremely long period of no sales uh, following this particular crisis. So anyway, I'm sure I have all the same questions as everybody else. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Jane. Jane. Hi, I'm uh, Janie Simpson. I'm with the ACTS, which is the Arts and Culture Center of Sussex. I'm the executive and artistic director there. Hi, Amy. Nice to see you. Amy has exhibited in our gallery before, has been a curator for us. So my big, my big concern is that we have been closed since uh, March 14th and we're multidisciplinary. So we have music concerts, we have literary readings, we have visual exhibitions, we have um, a ceramic studio that's about to come on board in May. Uh, and there's a big rush for content and there's a bit of pressure to provide content. And so I'm trying to balance, be balanced in my approach with my board and with the understanding that I don't want to, I don't want to rush to completely talk about changing our delivery methods just yet 
till I understand really what I'm dealing with, but I still want to be open and flexible. And I also want to um, be respectful of artists who are not making an income right now, and yet there is such a rush to offer a, some kind of panacea to people who are home and, and need, need something to do and who are kind of desperately reaching for the arts. So I guess I'm kind of looking to see what other arts organizations are doing to be balanced and yet respect the fact that artists need to be paid at the end of the day and we kind of have to figure out how to make this happen as a, as a group. Right. Thank you, Jane. Um, Joy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I've been a professional artist for the last 48 years, primarily uh, a painter, but I also write. And I have a, I'm associated with uh, CARFAC, and I was founding member of PLANS, the Professional Living Artists of Nova Scotia. And I've been on the board of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. And I'm just working every day. I'm really enjoying um, the fact that I don't have to do anything except paint. True. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lucy. Hi. Um, I'm Lucy McDonald. I'm the Curator of Education and Community Outreach at the Owens Art Gallery in Sackville, New Brunswick. I'm also on the call is my colleague Rachel, who you'll um, meet. So we're all working from home and um, uh, trying to think creatively about how to bring our programs and collections online, developing um, ways of working collaboratively and, and essentially experimenting with online, um, with our online presence as 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 we're all working outside of the gallery. All right, thank you, Lucy. Uh, Mark Hopkins. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Hopkins here. I, I'm a conductor and sound painter, which is an improvised musician, improvising music musician. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of the largest music festival in North America, which is Music Fest Canada. And uh, we just shut down a festival with 10,000 students supposedly going to show up in Calgary um, in May. That, that is completely closed. So there's quite a um, sort of range of impacts here. And I'm uh, honestly quite worried about the, um, the future of being live and in person and making music with groups of people. It's, it's uh, very disturbing. And at the same time, I too am loving being at home and exploring writing projects and doing all those other things. But I'm very, I'm really listening hard to hear about how people are, are dealing with things now. And aside from canceling them the way I did, and how we might move forward with an ear to live music. Right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mary. So we're trying to unmute you here. It's not working. Maybe we're working against each other. Go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I think it's okay now. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Mary Blatherwick, and um, I teach at the University of New Brunswick, and I teach the visual art education courses and the creativity courses there. Um, of course, huge change at the university, as you can imagine. Um, everything is canceled and never postponed. So there's been a lot of meetings um, talking about how we can deliver. Uh, different courses and so on. I'm not entirely sure about the visual ones because obviously most of it's hands-on, um, but uh, obviously it's going to become photography and, and videography that I'll, I'll have to resort to or move to um, for the time being. Um, so a lot of meetings about that going on uh, on a weekly basis. Um, the other, uh, I, I've been on a lot of different boards and, and on CNEL's um, advisory um, council as well and and also I, I, um, I chair an organization called the Atlantic Center for Creativity um, and uh, so we've been meeting regularly as we always do and we've started an initiative we've started a series of videos um, people anyone can can go on and uh, decide to share some kind some kind of creative thing that they do 
And so that just started last week. So I invite people to, uh, to, to look into that if you're interested in adding something to it. So it really was to create an activity um, that you could share, that, you could, you, that someone out there, anyone could try, could be a student, could be a, another artist, or could be someone in the public. Um, so that's been kind of fun to kind of get something that people could work on together. So um, I think like everyone else, I also am a painter and uh, uh, it's been wonderful having some time at home <laughs> to actually uh, do some work of my own. Um, but I think the main thing is, is the connecting and, um, and, you know, we're creative people. So it's like, how can we share things and how can we um, get the word out there about different things we're working on? Um, I too am worried about what's going to happen when this all ends in terms of galleries and and the selling of artwork and all of that. But again, I think, you know, some way that maybe we, we move more to an online platform, I'm not sure. But um, I'm hoping that uh, if we could work on that notion of creativity during this period of time, I mean, if there's, if there's anything that's gonna save people right now, it's being creative. So hopefully that will inspire people uh, when it's over to continue to think about, wow, artists are people who actually got us through this. So hopefully, you know, that's something we can think about. Thank you, Mary. Um, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm the Curator of Digital Engagement at the Owens Art Gallery at Mount Allison University. And like Lucy was saying, we're just have been, we've all been working from home. We're not able to go to the gallery. So we're just, um, yeah, thinking of ways that we can collaborate from a distance with everybody who works at the Owens and also thinking about how we can use our cr collection creatively online. Uh, but also thinking forward to projects that can support contemporary artists in an online space. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Ryan. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I, uh, I'm a musician and an administrator at uh, Interaction School of Performing Arts in St. John. Uh, St. John, New Brunswick. And uh, so we are a performing arts school. We do music, theater, and dance classes, uh, mainly for kids. There are a few. There's one adult acting class, but largely group classes. And we just started our third term um, after March break. So we're both in a situation where we need to figure out, like, our theater departments were working towards spring performances. We're going to do a Shakespeare festival in June, which now is obviously at the window. We've already, we've already canceled some recitals in March. Uh, so there's the challenge of how to finish our year, but there's also um, billing wise, the year is split up and people pay by term. So we're now out also a big chunk of our revenue if we don't figure this out. Um, so right, I'm, I'm, I'm here really just to see what other people are up to. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Cheryl. Hi, I'm uh, Cheryl Crowley and uh, I work as an artist. Um, I do my own work, but uh, this year I, I was actually doing three different school residencies. Um, two were ongoing and one was about to start up when uh, everything got closed up. Um, so I'm just interested to hear about ideas of, of what's happening um, across the spectrum of, of bringing art to communities and, and to schools and different populations. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, not sure the name, but Third Space. Hi, I'm Katie Buckley, and I'm the Executive Director for Third Space Gallery, and I started this job three weeks ago. So that's not great timing, <laughs> but um, I have a really good board and um, we're doing our best. Uh, we've had to postpone and cancel a couple of our smaller um, regular programming uh, and events, but we're going ahead with Third Shift, which is our annual Art at Night Festival. It's our biggest event and it's on August 21st. And right now we're just in the beginning stages of trying to figure out uh, what that could look like in the early stages. Um, uh, in order to make it comply with the, the new restrictions. Um, maybe have an online component. Uh, yeah, so we're just, we're brainstorming now. So I thought maybe some people would have some ideas uh, about some online programming. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Tim Borlase and I, uh, I live in New Brunswick, but I work a lot in uh, uh, Labrador, Northern Labrador. Uh, and uh, I guess my, uh, my question 
to the people present is uh, uh, I organize an arts festival which has uh, artists um, mainly in November but also in the summertime and we employ them to do projects in communities uh, but it ultimately engages schools and even in the summer uh, uh, it involves getting hold of teachers and to or orchestrate it, uh, the partnership with the arts festival and with the artists. My question is, uh, am I able to do that? Like, um, I know uh, schools are closed, teachers are off. Uh, if I were a teacher, would I want to be uh, approached by somebody who is trying to organize something that may or may not occur and uh, you know, like I, I guess I'm looking at the time investment uh, on the part of teachers and schools so I wondered if you had other people had some experience with that and what their how and whether or not to uh, to go ahead with an application when you're not really sure it's really going to happen okay thank you Tim and uh, just have a couple more introductions and then maybe somebody can uh, can address that uh, we'll go with Wes. Trying to unmute you here. It's not working. You might have to do it on your end. There you go. How about now? Yeah, great. Okay, good. Hi, uh, I'm Wes Johnston, um, uh, assistant curator at Dalhousie Art Gallery, and um, yeah, which is uh, uh, a university art gallery uh, in a university with no visual art program. So we're kind of in an interesting spot right now. Um, we had to postpone a show, um, which actually wasn't the biggest problem. Um, uh, we were actually planning on being shut down anyway this uh, summer because uh, there was a building expansion happening. So it's like kind of like this perfect storm of uh, things happening. So in a way that's canceled out our most immediate concerns. I guess what I'm curious about is, you know, what you know, what the second wave of this might be. It's, uh, it could come back again, or is, you know, it's obviously going to uh, impact things to come in terms of um, in-person things. And similar to the Owens Gallery, uh, yeah, we're thinking about what we can do in the interim with, you know, virtual programming and social media and uh, exploring use of the collection online and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's about that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Wes. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> um, I think we got everyone. Is there anyone that I've missed? If you want to um, turn on your video or unmute yourself and you can jump in at this point. All right. So yeah, Larry, you want to continue on? I'm, I unmuted myself. Yes. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for sharing the those thoughts. Um, really, uh, oh, I, I know I wanted to really make a point of thanking the Canada Council because they gave us a grant for working on a digital strategy, which just happens to coincide with the world's biggest use of digital technology. So we're able to do this because we were in place for that. Um, I, I always want to ask how people are doing personally. Now, I've heard from three of you that you're just loving <laughs> being at home and, and, and uh, apparently aren't feeling stressed at all, the three of you. But I, generally, I find that there's a lot of tension and stress out there and, um, and, uh, and anxiety. And I, I wonder how you personally have been feeling and are there ways that you've been coping with that? And this is one where you put your hand up and yeah, yeah. Well, uh, joy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm feeling a huge amount of stress. And uh, for me, uh, painting uh, is an escape from the stress. And so if I just sit and paint and don't listen to any news, I just put myself in a different place. So uh, yeah, it's not exactly being totally happy. Right, right. Uh, yes, Ryan. 
Um, I find it, I, I'm finding it stressful too. I, while I am a musician and I love being at home and I've actually enjoyed, like I can teach my lessons from my place and it's comfortable and everything. But I also, for work, I get paid by the hours. So I need to try to fill hours in a space that's not normally used for those things. And I, I'm finding like the psychological, like normally I go to another building and do tasks that are related to that space. And I'm, I'm finding it a challenge, especially because everything is online and there are so many distractions. Um, it's hard to, to, to keep those things separate for me. Wait, Otherwise, I mean, I love working out of my, when I, at first when I heard like, you mean I don't have to leave the house? Um, great. But, you know. Yeah, I think reality is starting to set in for everybody at this point, yeah. Um, Amy. Um, so I similarly, I guess, in teaching from home, um, I find the time that I'm spending on things is just so different. And so I'm kind of getting used to that. Um, whereas most of my time with my students was face to face and there weren't a lot of emails in between class time. Now I'm, I'm constantly on emails and sort of, um, kind of like to helping them through their their stress as well because they're just trying to finish up the year and they don't know what's coming next either so i find that i'm actually spending more time at work for for the teaching than i was before which is i don't know ironic i think but great thank you anyone else have anything you can raise your hand digitally or also wave down yes mark Hi, um, just really quickly, I, I, I may have uh, misspoke at the beginning. I, I am loving being at home and doing my work, but I, uh, I am mourning the loss of a month in Paris with side trips to Sweden and tour, um, income that I'll never see again. And at the same time, as I say, everything I do is live and in person with groups of musicians, um, whether it's sound painting or as a performer, or whether it's as a gestural musician, as a conductor. And I am just worried about where this is going to go next. So I'm here to listen, I won't talk much more, but I, I am very, very concerned about how we're gonna do the very human thing of making art together and being live in the same room as art, as, as musicians and, and painters and sculptors. It's, it's worrying me greatly. I also have a role in teaching music. Um, I, I work at Acadia University in the music education area. And so I'm, I, I just don't know where this is going to go, if it's gonna create a new normal, and I'll stop talking. Feel free to continue talking, it's good. Uh, <laughs> Jane. Um, it's, I guess, further to my original sort of preamble, I guess, when I introduced myself. Um, like Mark said, I can understand the rush to move content online, but Axe is a really intimate venue, and we pride ourselves on that intimacy and there's something that's lost in the translation from that intimate venue online to uh, intimate venue rather to moving things online. And I want to be sure that I'm being flexible and considering alternate programming, but with always with an eye to to getting back to quote unquote normal and not I don't want to shoot myself in the foot and I and I don't want to shoot artists in the foot. I want to be sure that we're not setting ourselves up to some kind of different reality that's going to mean artists aren't compensated the way they need to be compensated and that we're still offering authentic experiences to the people who come to visit the Arts and Culture Center. Artists get paid and, uh, and we don't add to the noise. I don't want to add to any more noise and distraction that, that people are already feeling. I mean, I don't know how many online concerts I got invited to in the past week. And I love the idea that artists are being paid. I don't like the concept of a tip jar because they need to be paid for what they're worth and not just a tip. But um, I, I just worry that I don't want to add to the distraction, I guess. Great. Thank you, Jane. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Either a wave or a digital hand. <laughs> okay, Larry, I think we're 
Can you do it? <laughs> I'm trying to unmute you. There you there. go. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's the first time you and I have had that problem. Usually we're in sync with this, but apparently not today. Um, thank you very much. That's um, so. It, what and this is what I'm finding too is that people are being very professional and trying to be very level-headed, but at, at the same time, there's often an underlying anxiety that uh, that I think is important to acknowledge because it affects our productivity and. Um, um, I'm thinking about, um, not in the arts field, but um, I've been talking to friends and family members who are working from home and they seem to feel approximately that they're, they're doing about a 50% productivity at the moment from home because uh, it, it's just so difficult. If they have children at home, it's difficult and so on. So it's, it's not so easy. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now is the time that we're going to try to uh, pull out, so, uh, find out what specifically you've been doing or if you know of someone who's been doing things digitally or not digitally i mean uh walking down the street to people's windows or whatever is not digital but it's, it's a way of of um of continuing it might be the way of continuing your work so um how what measures have you been taking uh to kind of um carry on your work as much as you can um while under these conditions? That's the next question, really. Yes, Andrea. Hey, um, so uh, for Visual Arts Nova Scotia generally, we're in some ways we're um, positioned well, uh, which is great because we're gonna be in a good position to help artists who want to find resources and ways to try to translate some of what they may have been doing in in-person ways to an online way either um i absolutely hear you jane in terms of concern about uh kind of going wholesale into some kind of idea of a digital reality here i don't think that's it but i do think that if we have some tools that we can give people to use either as a stopgap or that will become a part of their practice going forward then that can be a really great thing um, so uh, we are, we actually had to postpone a series of in-person sessions about podcasting that we have support for. Uh, and Erin Foster, as some of you may know, who is uh, leading the charge on that, she's doing uh, contract work with us around that. So obviously we're in the midst of figuring out how to get that back up and running in a different way uh, because that was specific work about helping artists to get into the podcasting space basically so um, timely but just a little a hair too late in terms of the in-person workshop time for that um, we have over the last I'd say two years been creating more online opportunities where we are a provincial organization um, there's been a lot of um, requests over the years for us to create ways for people to participate in our workshops online um, and things by distance or things existing as satellite uh, so maybe it's something that's happening um, in another part of the province uh, so we do have um, we've had a series of about three to four of our workshops um, in our spring and fall series over the last two years that have been happening as online workshops. And so Carrie McKay uh, is working diligently right now to figure out for our spring workshop series, how many can we get up online? How many of our instructors that don't already teach that way are comfortable to teach that way? So we have some good infrastructure that's already in place. Um, and you know our peer-to-peer -peer application review process we were able to just actually get one of those going this week um, so that is what it sounds like you help each other you read each other's grants and applications and that has always been an online exchange because people the way people are working some people might come together but it's peer-to-peer -peer. Uh, my own program is uh, the most necessarily hands-on and in-person of artists in classrooms with teachers and students. Um, and so we are, um, one thing that we did, and I, 
I know it's not possible for everyone, but if you can, uh, we were able to make a decision to send out 50% uh, of the fees for upcoming workshops that were planned between now and the end of the school year to artists um, with the proviso that they will be paid the other 50% if and when the project can happen in person in classroom, be that next fall, uh, or if they're into it, we'll help them create an online workshop that they can deliver either to that same planned group of students or if it's something that can be opened up more broadly, we'll help them do that. And that is all just happening right now. So I can tell you that we're working on it, but right now we don't have any of that actually happening yet. So one of the big challenges there will be, can, will the teachers be able to connect with us on that? Or is the pressure and weight that's on them right now about what they're trying to deliver too great for them to even talk to us as the artist in the schools program? They may just be like, I can't even, which is fair enough. And if that's the case, we'll create it as a way that can be, as a program that can be accessed by students directly, as opposed to through their teacher and to them. I know the schools are all just still figuring out how they're going to do any and all of that. So um, that's, that's a bit of uh, what we're working on. And of course, we're all working remotely, the three of us at Vans and Aaron. Wow, a lot going on. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. I think yeah. that's really helpful. Um, someone else want to talk about what uh, efforts you're doing right now to kind of sustain or uh, improve or, you know, adjust at this point? Raise your hand or... <clears throat> yes, Jane. Um, we, we're very fortunate on our board to have a treasurer who is um, a CGA and she's helping us with looking at the benefits packages that are coming through the government. So that's really helpful. She's looking at that 75% wage subsidy and we're all trying to dig into that 30% loss of revenue that you have to prove. Is that over a sustained period of time? What does that actually mean? Um, and how, how does that work with a nonprofit like ours, like a charitable arts organization? We don't sell widgets, for example. So I don't think it's gonna be any big stretch for us to show we've lost 30% of our revenue but um, she's helping us to deal with that. And I've been doing pandemic preparedness planning really for about three weeks now because we sort of knew it was coming. Um, and so I've been, part of my concern, I guess, is that I have staff and I wanna be sure that our staff are supported and that we're not so quick to lose staff because really you know sometimes it's the most valuable asset you have as, as an organization so I'm, I'm doing some pandemic prep and sharing passwords and all that horrible stuff that you have to think about but um really i'm lucky that we have a, a supportive board of volunteers and we have somebody who's digging into that financial side i have a fund development and business officer who is doing some three-month projections to help us figure out look at those losses and, and figure out where we're gonna be in terms of a worst case scenario in three months. And unofficially, we're looking at six months to a year just to, just to see where we are and what we may have to do. We're looking at like cutting our internet, for example, because we have a building that's not being used and apparently Bell Alliant is increasing rates. So can we get away with some of that stuff? So I'd be really, I'd be very interested to see what other organizations are looking at in terms of are they are you amending your grants to include an online component your grant applications because a lot of grant deadlines have been extended so we're looking at implementing all all those kinds of things too but the other thing i've done too is is i've asked tourism heritage and culture the department the New Brunswick department of tourism heritage and culture to work with canada council or, or we need a translator Arts, arts organizations and artists need a translator for these benefits packages that are coming down from the government. And I, I would like to know in plain language how I can help artists 
get access to funds that they need and how I myself as an arts organization am going to be able to apply for those things specific to our industry. That's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tim. Um, I, I have a, just a very small uh, example that I heard about on the radio this morning in Moncton. Uh, there's a, a French music teacher in, uh, in a community outside Moncton, Capolet. He's also a, a singer. And what he has decided to do is to uh, uh, produce uh, in his small studio in his apartment uh, songs that are meaningful to people. They request a song and he rehearses it and then performs it on his Facebook page. And he does this as a way to combat stress. Uh, so he, uh, I think he explains in the delivery of the song why this is a meaningful song for other people. And uh, I mean, he is not being paid for this at this point, but I, I, they played one of his songs this morning and I, I couldn't help but think uh, this will have a, a great effect on, on people who have, uh, have songs in their lives that are meaningful to them. And uh, I thought it was a way of uniting the arts with uh, some of the fears of the pandemic. That's my example. Thank you, Tim. And I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to Tim's original question, which was about um, teachers at this time and reaching out to teachers um, and whether or not that's uh, something that teachers would welcome at this point. I don't know if anyone has anything to respond to that. Yes, Andrea. Uh, really simply, I have waited. I am, I've been crafting my email to teachers. I am going to start sending it out on Friday. Uh, I am sending individual messages to the teachers that are involved with projects that were supposed to be happening. Um, and I'm making it very clear to them that I completely understand if they don't have any time for this right now, but that we are here if they have time for this. We will help them in whatever way we can. If it's about getting the specific project that was happening out to their kids, we'll help them figure out how to do that digitally. If it's about helping them to try to meet some kind of a curriculum outcome that's about art that doesn't have to do with that project, we'll do what we can to support them in that. Um, but I think uh, it's been my, my impulse and supported by my colleagues that we need to tread very carefully because teachers are, well, we're all in, the, we're all in a traumatic situation right now, globally, we're all in this traumatic situation and teachers are now being tasked with creating ways of teaching and engaging with their students in ways that they were never trained to do, in ways that they may be very uncomfortable with, in ways that they know are not equitable that not all students can be reached digitally. Um, so being very cognizant of that in any approach to teachers right now is, is what I'm trying to do. And um, so I don't know if Friday is the right time. I don't know if I'm still going too early, but I'm just gonna send out the gentlest message I can to let them know we're working on some things to try to support them. And if there's something different that we could do that we want them to let us know and if they don't want to talk to us until the fall or some later time, that's fine too. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, we've been definitely hearing from people across the country about different supports that are in place for the STEM, uh, the STEM subjects. And people are really afraid that the arts are not being supported. Arts education is not necessarily being supported in the schools. So while I can't speak for a teacher, I think you know supports may be welcome from uh, from others, <clears throat> other organizations. Anyone else have anything to add? Yes, Elizabeth. Let's try that. 
unmute you here. There you go. Yeah, sorry. I'm gonna un I'm gonna stop the video because I I disappeared for a while because Zoom actually causes my computer to overheat and shut down. So that's a technical problem I have to address. So I'm just gonna cut the image for a second here. Um, yeah, I so I didn't hear Tim's original question because I was trying to turn the computer back on. But um, is there something that concerns me that needs to be put into the mix? Is the the um, well, I wouldn't exactly call it a threat, but the balance between free and paid, which um, I have been trying to maintain my cello studio of private music students, and also I'm giving a few paid art lessons, but. I think there's a really real, there's so much beautiful online stuff out there already that everybody can access for free. I think that it's it it's going to be quite difficult for us to maintain over a long period of time, if this should go on, our own individual paid work in the face of such a huge choice of, of stuff. So I, I just wanted to throw that into the discussion, actually. How do we, how can we guarantee that? How can we find a balance between paid and free and or will the world just go for all free and then none of us will be able to earn any money uh, from what we do. Yeah, absolutely a concern. Um, you know, how do you attach value to something that's being offered for free now? Yeah, did anybody else have something to uh, <clears throat> contribute there? Oh, yes. Sorry, Wes. I'm trying to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks for all your comments, everyone. It's been uh, it's really interesting to um, get a really well-rounded picture of, of what people's concerns are. I really picked up on um, what you said, Andrea, about, about you know, global trauma right now in this moment. And um, you know, I'm feeling very fortunate myself that I'm able to work from home and have have an income. Um, and then, but you know, basically, uh, the people we would be paying. Um, I mean, we did pay fifty percent to the show we have postponed. So, um, but it, but it has been making me think about how um, what the trickle down is in terms of uh, funding and and how we pay artists and. Uh, I think one good thing that can come out of this slowing down period is just to think about redistribution um, and uh, without any further, like, you know, that's a very broad topic, but um, uh, it's, it's, you know, in the minutia, it's like, yeah, how, how do we balance the, the free versus the artist fees? Um, when we're talking about artist fees, we're talking about uh, contractual work or the gig economy it's like it's already precarious so yeah I'm just curious about how um, you know Carfac and other other um, other union or kind of um, advocacy groups might actually um, shift in this moment and uh, and look at I don't know what it is like a look at uh, progressive models for um, you know, an artist wage or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. That's pretty broad. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone have any response to that? Yes, Anna. Sorry, go ahead. Preoccupied uh, with. Uh, we all know that uh, in the past, it has uh, artists have really been uh, uh, have really you know have been uh, uh, overly uh, uh, asked for contributions, donations, and so on and so forth. And that has been something that we have been looking at uh, for for a number of years now, without yeah, with a certain amount of success, I guess, but still a, a major. Um, a major consideration for all artists. So obviously this, uh, with the pandemic, obviously I really think that it could very well be uh, making it worse. And uh, the question of, of balance is definitely again gonna come into play. All right, thank you. Other comments on that free versus paid? 
Has anybody been uh, attempting anything, whether through your own efforts or also social media? Um, anything, anybody found anything? Yes, Mark. Um, hi, I was just gonna say that um, one of the uh, concerts I was supposed to be leading was in Calgary and it was for a national organization and that got completely blown up, it was in May. But the interesting thing is the National Arts Center has stepped in because it is a high profile national performance representing students from across the country. They're going to actually try to do one of those virtual performances and they're putting NACO resources, National Arts Center Orchestra resources behind giving private lessons to those people who were gonna be involved. They were university and, and advanced high school students in this particular group. So there are national education and outreach organizations like NACO that, that have, I know in, in the field of music, have resources that can help us do things. The funny part about all of that was, if ever, I was I'm thrilled that something's gonna happen for the students who are involved. Um, they, I was told pretty clearly that, that there was no um, remuneration for, for the organizational end and for, for me from what I do as, as teacher leader, but I don't really care. I'm in a very fortunate position, um, having a foot in an arts world and in an academic world that I don't have to worry about funding that way. But one of my colleagues, it is a concern. And I, I just want to put that out there that, that I agree that there is a chance that we can become undervalued through the the use of our um, through the use of online line resources, and that was just a comment I wanted to add. Absolutely, thank you, Mark. Someone else? <clears throat> yes, Ryan. Um, yeah, that's something that I've run into myself, just uh, particularly with regard to music lessons, like. Yesterday, I had um, a piano student and she finished her like primer level book and is ready for the next one. And of course, the series, they want you to buy four different books. And um, so anyway, she learned a C major scale. I found a video on YouTube of how to do it. And attached to this video is if you like this, sign up to my course for free lessons. <laughs> and so the question for me very quickly becomes, why would this student choose me over this other person who's offering? And of course, it's like, there's a teaser intro course, and then you at a certain point have to buy the next level. Um, and for me, the challenge uh, is particularly because I'm coming through the same device as this other course is. But I think the answer for myself anyway, I can really only speak to music lessons is that the whatever one size fits all video course, even if it's targeted to beginners, still isn't off, gonna offer personal feedback and the student can't have an actual relationship with that. And um, speaking from my own experience, because I'm, so I'm a drummer is my like background historically. Uh, I teach drum lessons and depending where I'm working, it'll cost you, you know, 85 to hundred dollars a month to hire me. You can get a subscription called Drumeo, something called Drumeo, which is like Netflix for drum lessons. It's $35 a month. Why would anyone choose me over that? But it is, you know, the, the, the personal feedback, the uh, personal encouragement, the, even just the, like, here's what you should do next. For me, that um, really is the saving grace of it all. And if I can give an example for myself as a student, um, I took a drum lesson in Los Angeles a couple of years ago with this guy who's like drum teacher to the stars. He's a body mechanics guy. I took, I bought his uh, online course and um, I bought it at a discount. It's normally about $200 and he walks you through all the mechanics of everything. But after watching through it, I'm still left with, well, I still need him to tell me if I'm doing it right. <laughs> like, I'm going to have to, I don't know, get Skype lessons with this guy because I don't actually know if what I'm doing is correct. So I think there is still an opportunity there, but I know like it, just numbers wise, I've seen probably a third of my students have not opted to do online lessons because it's, it's an activity for depending on the age of the student. Um, it's not so much to my own frustration. Sometimes it's not about serious discussion of the art form. It's more like, we're going to try this out. We're going to do something for half hour. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And what uh, platform are you using to uh, offer your lessons? 
All over the map. Um, I've been using Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, even Facebook video chat, which I really don't like. But um, just because to me, that's a boundary that should be kept clear. But it was before I really knew uh, what I was doing at a couple of parents approached me about using it. So I just agreed. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, we've had some people who are, um, I was shocked to learn busier than ever with uh, teaching, teaching the arts online because now there are people at home, adults at home who are, have nothing to do. And so they're looking at learning the arts as well. And, but then there's, uh, you know, it's very complex as far as access, et cetera, who has the technology and, and whatnot. So, but um, <clears throat> anything else is from anyone as far as uh, the efforts that you're doing online to kind of sustain your work? or the free versus uh, paid discussion. Yes, Elizabeth. Sorry, here, turn down here. Okay, yeah, I, I just, I really appreciate what you said, Ryan, and I just wanna, I have, <clears throat> it doesn't just concern the arts, actually, it also concerns the entire education system because my sister is a, an elementary school teacher, so every morning, uh, because my studio is in her house, we have our COVID-19 discussion before we start the day. And she is attempting to communicate personally with her students. So one of the things I think is really true that we could draw a distinction between is the personal and local connection versus the, you know, going online somewhere and connecting to the entire world as being something really precious. And so because she can see the whole Nova Scotia education curriculum going out the window after this simply because lots of parents are just designing classes for their children online because the Nova Scotia education system hasn't done it yet and um, they're finding everything that they need already um, but without that personal curated aspect and person to person thing so I think it's it's actually really really important to bring this forward because it could easily get lost so I wholeheartedly agree with Ryan. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Other comments there? Hey, Larry, if you want to move on to the next question, I think everybody is. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and most of what you've been talking about, is what I was hearing, uh, was um, about how you're coping under the circumstances, trying to do what you were doing before, but in a new way and so on. Um, but uh, can I ask also, is there a way that you're using your art form um, to, to contribute towards this overcoming the isolation, overcoming the, the stress uh, and so on of this corona situation? In other words, to what extent are you able to think about using your art form to help people through this time? <clears throat> yeah, does, I, does anyone have anything to add to that? I think people have somewhat uh, talked about it a little bit, but... Oh yes, Mark. Sorry, trying to unmute you here. <clears throat> Sorry, Mark, I'm having trouble unmuting you. Are you able? Don't know if you're able. Here we go. Maybe. Sorry about that. Um, it's funny you should mention the uh, what are we doing to try and make a contribution. Um, there's a, a work by a, a madrigal, in fact, by a, a composer in, in the early 1800s using a text from the 1600s that I'm in the midst of transcribing and I want to give for free to all of my colleagues um, in, in my field, in wind and, and orchestral music sort of field. And uh, it's the text is heartbreaking and beautiful and I'm, I'm just going to actually send it out there after this is done and and ask people to to if they wish to perform it to make a contribution to i don't know which organization it will be but it's been it's given me a lot of personal meaning for all the things that, did, that went away to be investing a dozen hours so far and more to follow in in this one project that i want to share with everybody else around 
and I hope that they will, I, I'm, I'm still finalizing the details of how that will work, but I, I hope they'll pick up and, and feel the same way about it that I do. So that's one little thing I'm doing outside of the norm that I hope is gonna contribute artistically and otherwise to what goes forward. Okay, <laughs> um, that sounds really great, first of all. Um, I have been, um, I've been like carrying on with work and like my own personal work and making plans for exhibitions and that type of thing and trying to be a support to my peers. Um, and I see a lot of my peers also posting um, free workshops and different things online. Um, and although I'm still making plans and creating things and I haven't put anything online for free yet for a wider community because I feel really um, conflicted about that as somebody who often has to sort of fight for a fair wage. Um, so yeah, so I don't think that that's something that I'm probably going to do. I'm gonna kind of keep them close to my chest and see what comes of it, but I have no problem putting content online for free if I've already been paid for the creation of it. Um, I do have a lot of like curriculum documents and things like that that are up on different organizations sites. But yeah, I think the idea that I should be putting things online to help everyone else through this is a bit um, misguided. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Having fun with mute today. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, thank you, Amy. And what I was saying was that there's, hopefully you're following along the chat as well. There's some great comments going on there um, as well. So um, yes, absolutely. Um, as far as what the, the network is doing uh, to support the arts and learning community, um, we're obviously hosting these roundtable discussions. Uh, but we also have a, a page, uh, I'll throw it over to Caitlin now. She has been compiling resources and uh, for the sector online, and she has a page that, uh, that has them all listed there. Yeah, so um, I have, I'm going to share in the chat box a list of resources that uh, we have on our website. Um, that's very much a living document at this point. It includes everything from um, funding and kind of emergency funding resources for folks in the sector, as well as like skill sharing uh, websites, um, like Facebook groups where people are kind of uh, sharing our classes and stuff like that. Um, and if anyone has anything that they'd like to contribute to it, by all means, let me know. Uh, I'll also put my email address in there if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, but yeah, I hope it's a useful document for someone. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And we know that uh, Tim forwarded, a, there are many organizations that are kind of sending these, these resources around, such as ArtsLink, New Brunswick sent one around. Anything that we see, we also um, put on our, our page as well, or anything that is talked about in these particular sessions. Um, so there's a, and also our website, I'm sure you're, you may or may not be familiar with the Canada's map of arts and learning, but we have a list, uh, almost 9,000 uh, artist educators and arts organizations and schools on there. Um, and we're looking right now at expanding that to uh, talk more about digital learning and creating a directory of people who are offering online lessons during this time and, and moving forward as well. And it's been interesting. Many of you know of the Canada Council Digital Strategy Grant. And uh, so that was kind of their, uh, their reason for doing that was to get artists to think about moving into the digital. And now everybody is somewhat forced to do that. So uh, 
So that's, it's been really great to find out what everyone is doing as well. Does anyone have anything else to add as far as their efforts online or uh, anything at this point? I think the, our final question is basically, what else can we as a network do to support the work that you're doing? And uh, if anyone has any, uh, any thoughts on that, please let, let us know. Yes, Jane. Um, I'm wondering if, do we know if there is a group that is looking at advocacy for artists in terms of, like, you know, we've talked uh, quite frankly, I think in the chat section, at least on about the concept of a basic income mm -hmm. and the need for basic income. And I've seen my partner is a writer and he's got a book coming out in September. So he was supposed to teach a workshop. Um, and of course, he's lost that workshop income. But what he's also lost is that intangible possible income, that opportunity to promote a book that's coming out in September. Um, that opportunity to connect with people and so so I'm wondering first of all um, do we know if there is a group that is advocating on behalf of artists and talking about a serious um, shot in the arm financially for artists who are so many are living below the poverty line if they're trying to be professional artists most most are struggling and so I'm wondering if that's happening and if we know of um, any kind of survey work that's going on about tracking not only lost income, but lost <laughs> intangible income. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, Caitlin, if you wanna answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm gonna share a link with, I can't speak to the finances specifically, but I am gonna share a link to a survey that was created by, um, in a collaboration with Arts Pond, and I lost my gig. Um, it's basically a survey that they're asking folks in the arts sector to really help them gauge the impact of what this is going to have like now, a couple months from now, and it's going to be a long-term thing. So I would encourage everyone to fill that out. It's also, the link is also in that document that I shared earlier. So. Yeah, so there are there are a few organizations that uh, I've noticed that are really um, trying to do this advocacy work. Obviously, we're going to be doing some as well. We're planning on writing letters with with um, uh, information from these roundtable sessions and um, also writing the report um, for arts arts and learning specifically, not necess not for. Um, professional artists necessarily, but for the arts and learning aspect of things. Uh, but uh, there are, especially on that resource page that, that Caitlin uh, shared, there are a number of, of organizations that are doing it and hopefully uh, we can figure out a way to uh, join forces so that it's a much stronger message going forward. <clears throat> Jennifer, I'll, I'll add just that um, there was, Jennifer and I were able to participate in a, a kind of an online meeting, I guess it was, they called it a webinar, with the um, Federal Minister of Culture. And um, we, we were able to submit questions. And uh, I did submit a question pretty much as to what you were asking, Jane. Um, it's very much, uh, you know, what, what, what can be done for, for artists to artists? Will artists be able to benefit from the plans that have been made already? And um, the, the, well, in that actual webinar, there were only time for about five sort of like super questions, but they, the minister did say that all of the questions would go to his staff and they would follow up on it. And, and so, and there will be more of those. So hopefully, hopefully word is getting through. I know that they're trying to help not-for-profits, but not all not-for-profits are the same, uh, but, at least we did put the word in. That's one small piece of advocacy. Mm -hmm. We've had some um, additional governmental um, representatives show up at the roundtable discussions. So someone from Canadian Heritage 
uh, was on a discussion recently and encouraged us to reach out to them after with our report afterwards. Uh, so it's definitely uh, in the works and in the plans uh, as a result of these roundtable discussions. Um, and also additional, potentially additional roundtable discussions or, or webinars that are, are resulting from what you're talking about here today. So something that kind of sparked for me was, um, was a, who, Jane, I think, was talking about um, plain language and trying to understand these benefits. And so that kind of sparked for me as a potential, something that we could potentially help with um, and post uh, or even offer a webinar, get somebody on who could uh, who could help kind of translate these these documents for people. Um, but we're looking at additional uh, additional things that we can do to help the sector. So again, and we're going to be sending a follow up survey. So I'm just going to do the last poll right now. I just sometimes get so caught up in the conversation I forget to watch the polls. Sorry about that. But um, uh, we are going to be sending a follow-up survey and uh, so if you think of something additional that we can do as a network uh, with our our limited resources of somewhat but um, to to help out uh, to support the work that you're doing uh, you can you can let us know there also if something has happened because we are um, we are also looking for funding and, and writing applications. So if anything has resulted from the work that we have done, if you have been supported in some way or something positive has, has happened, please do let us know that as well, because we're always looking uh, for real life examples that we can, we can cite in our, in our grant applications, et cetera, in our research as well. Um, so if anyone has any kind of final uh, comments or something you want to add, there's lots, going on in the, the chat as well and also I will be sending a link to this uh, to this video and you'll be able to see the chat as well if, if there's anything that you missed uh, or anything that you want to go back on at this point uh, you'll be able to see it when the video is disseminated to you um, and Larry did you have anything else to add Great. I just want to add my thanks um, very much for the big, very frank and open discussion. Um, and yes, I think that, I think that this was sort of, this is Jennifer, this was your idea to do these. And that was a very bright idea because by the time we finished, we will now have input from, to, from artists and artist educators and, and administrators right across the country. And we'll be able to say, look, these are the main concerns that people have. And, and these are, and look, we're trying to help. We're trying to do things, and uh, here's where we need some support. So I actually think this is going to um, be a very useful exercise, not only in saying hello to our, our friends and colleagues now and sharing horror stories and happy stories, <laughs> um, but also that it will become part of a piece of, uh, I think, very important advocacy, fact-based uh, advocacy. So I just want to thank you all and wish you all the very best. We'll get through this together. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.